Bible reading this evening comes from Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is, as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, he said, Jesus, 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It's the Lord's word. Well, please uh, keep your Bible open there to Luke chapter 23. We're only going to be really looking at the last uh, four or five verses there. Uh, We're only really going to be considering uh, the three men on those crosses at the end. It's interesting, God God can use any passage of Scripture to save a person, any passage. It's not beyond his uh, realm of ability. But as you look back through history, there are some passages that God has just so been pleased to use to save thousands, thousands, multitudes. You have your John 3, 16s. You have your Ephesians chapter 2, Matthew 11, whoever is weary, come unto me. And then you have this passage here, how many testimonies have been given of people who've been saved because of hearing the story of the thief on the cross. I wonder how many... On that day when they enter into glory, they'll be looking for that thief to meet him and say, your dying breaths, what happened to you on that cross, God used mightily for me. That place where you first saw your sin, where you felt your sin, and when you first saw Christ, that's the same place where I felt my sin and first saw Christ. We have that passage before us this evening, so it is a great joy to look at it. Let's ask the Lord for his special blessing again upon this special passage. Father, we come before you and everything is about you. Our whole lives are about you. But even in this moment, this weekend, perhaps has been especially more about you in the hearts of people. Lord, what a, what a wonderful passage we have read. Lord, there are things here that are too deep for human comprehension, things that when we get into glory, we'll spend eternity trying to grasp and uncover as we stand in awe of you. What an amazing thought it is to be here in your presence. You know every person who is here. No one is hidden from you. No heart is veiled from you. And you know all things. And so we pray, God, that you would do a great searching tonight. Do a great searching. May you expose us. May we consider what your word has to say. May your spirit be at work in our lives. I pray that we would, we too, like that thief, would get a clear vision of Christ on Calvary. Lord, may you do this by your spirit and may your son be lifted up. We ask for your help. We are needy, but you are powerful. And so we ask it in your son's name. Amen. We're in the Gospel of Luke, and I think it's just helpful noting that Luke has a thing with twos. He likes to reveal much about the kingdom through twos, as it were. So you remember he gave us the story of the two sisters who welcomed Jesus into their house. One of them was too busy serving, whilst the other one found the better thing, sat at Jesus' feet and just absorbed everything. He really focuses on twos. He gave that parable of two men who went to pray in the temple. One of them was a Pharisee who was self-righteous. Another one was a tax collector who pleaded for mercy and went home saved. He continues with the twos, as it were. There was a father who had two sons. One of them was supposedly devoted to the father but was self-righteous. Another one was a wayward son. And that wayward son who was a prodigal came back seeking mercy from his father and was restored. And nothing changes here. Luke gives us insight into something the other Gospels don't. He focuses on twos again. There are two men who are crucified with Christ. Two with very different outcomes. Two great sinners Two different responses to Christ and two eternal destinations that ensue. And so Luke keeps this up this evening. First, I want us, as we just work through verses 39, I want us to consider the desire of a hardened thief. The desire of a hardened thief. 
So the scene here is Jesus crucified and there were two other crucifixions with him. Now the, the word there for thief uh, that is used in the Gospels is robbers. These men uh, were robbers. They stole by force more than just thieves. So the scenery is Jesus has undergone great torture. So there's great physical suffering going on here, but simultaneously the authors are showing there is incredible blasphemous mockery coming from every direction. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the uh, blasphemous mockery from King Herod. Look at verse 11. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. Now you see the mockery from the religious leaders. Look at verse 35. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen ones. The chosen one. The mockery continues from the soldiers, Luke wants us to see. Verse 36, the soldiers also came up and mocked him, and they offered him wine, vinegar, and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there is the additional blasphemous mockery from Pilate. Don't miss it in verse 38. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. So you have a king mocking Jesus. You have a governor mocking Jesus. You have the religious leaders mocking Jesus. You have the soldiers mocking Jesus. But I think it's the next mockery that was the most painful and shameful. Look at verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Those who were in positions of power, they mocked him. And now the lowest of the lows mocks and insults him. A robber. And not just any robber. A robber who is being crucified. It doesn't get lower than that. Whilst he's hanging, it says he held insults at Christ. Now, one verse there, just verse 39, how much insight do we get from that one verse? How much insight do we, do we get into this man that's hanging on the cross? And we also get great insight into the heart of man as a whole. If given the opportunity, if given the opportunity, man will defy and mock God to his very face. You don't get closer to Jesus than this. And it's a great revelation of man. So the thief teaches us here much about the natural human condition. What do we see here? Look how terrible his predicament is, and it doesn't seem to soften him one bit towards Jesus. Not one bit. This man is literally in the valley of the shadow of death. This man literally knows that the sand in his hourglass is coming to an end. It's running out. And yet, though his minutes are numbered before his eyes, it doesn't soften him or incline him one bit closer to Jesus. Not one little bit. This great danger that lies before him, imminent death, doesn't change the leper spots. It doesn't, and it could not melt a heart of stone. It doesn't. Crisis cannot melt the heart of stone. It's unable. The opposite happens. It only further hardens him, and we see him here in his greatest moment of weakness, raging against the Son of God. Now, why should he rage him, rage against Christ? Why should he abuse Christ in this way? Because this is the natural desire of the human heart. Think about it. People who spend their lives pushing God away, ignoring Him, disobeying Him, going their own way when trouble and calamity hits and they're staring crisis down the barrel. Who is the person that they rage against? Who is the first one they start to abuse? Proverbs 19.3 says... A man's own foolishness leads, to ruin, leads him to ruin, yet his heart rages against the Lord. 
That's what you see on the cross. He's up there because of his sin. And who does he start abusing? God. We also see here the desire of the natural human heart. The desire of the natural human heart. What does this thief want? What is he after? He's not after forgiveness. He's not after mercy. He doesn't want to become holy. What does he want? He wants to cheat death. He wants to escape his suffering. Get us down from this cross if you're really who you claim to be. If the sign is right above your head. This is the desire. And you notice, he doesn't even ask. He demands. He commands Christ. Do it. Get us down from here. Save us from here. There's no humility There's no remorse and there's no desire for Jesus Christ himself. That's the problem. He just wants what he can get out of it. And my friends, this is a picture of man's heart. What I can get from Christ. This is what man wants. Humanity wants from God. What do they want? Temporal relief. This is what the world wants from God, temporal relief, temporal happiness. Help for when crisis comes. They want a kind of genie God who will help when things go incredibly wrong, but they do not want a Lord over them, not the king of the Jews. And so this is what he seeks. He seeks a genie. He seeks what he can get. There's so much here for us. If only hypocrites in churches would be as honest as this thief on the cross. If only they would. And confess, really and truly what I want is to be able to sin and not feel guilty. I want to be my own boss and live my own life. If only I can gratify every sinful urge that I have. But when trouble comes, God, come quickly. And help. You see this in him. One verse, and there's so much. So we've seen the desire of a hardened thief. Next, I want us to see the rebuke and confession from a softened thief. The rebuke and confession from a softened thief. The other thief who is on the cross now chimes in. Verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. Now, when you read that at first reading, it seems fitting. It seems like that thief should rebuke the other one and put him in his place. But really, if you are carefully reading this, this is surprising. This this rebuke is unexpected. It doesn't actually fit the narrative if you read carefully. Why does this completely blindside the reader? Because Matthew and Mark tell us something different about these robbers who were crucified next to Jesus. Matthew and Mark actually say these two robbers had more than thievery in common. There was more going on. They actually had the exact same attitude toward Jesus when they were first nailed to the cross. Let me tell you what Matthew says in chapter 27 verse 41. The leaders mocked him in the same way The robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. You see that? What does Mark say? Mark 15, 31. The religious leaders mocked him. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. So Matthew and Mark say both thieves were mocking Jesus on the cross. Luke says one thief was mocking him and the other one rebukes the other thief for mocking Jesus. What's going on here? What happened to our perfect Bible? You need to understand something. These thieves are hanging on the cross with Jesus for some six hours. A lot can happen in six hours. God doesn't need six hours to perform heart surgery on a rebellious sinner. And something happens here 
Something happens to the second thief. He went from insulting God and mocking Jesus with his fellow companion. And then he becomes the one who rebukes his fellow companion for mocking Jesus and doing what he was doing before. Something significantly changes here. And really, we get a glimpse and a foretaste of what happens to the Apostle Paul, don't we? That one who raged against Christ and sought to destroy Christ's body, he becomes the spokesman for Christ and the leader of Christ's body. So he's a changed man, this thief. What's happened? What's happened? What's this change? Well, he rebukes his companion, but how does he rebuke the other thief? How does he do it? Do you see it in the text? He brings God into the conversation. He brings God into the exchange of words. Did you notice what he says? Do you not fear God since we are under the same sentence? Herod mocked Jesus. Pilate mocked Jesus. The leaders mocked Jesus. The soldiers mocked Jesus. The other thief mocked Jesus. Even this thief was mocking Jesus. So why does he now stop? Because the fear of God came upon him. The fear of God came upon him. He says, don't you fear God? He was just mocking God. And now the fear of God comes upon him. It happens in an instant. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Make no mistake about it. There will be no forgiveness of sins for the one who does not fear God. There is no salvation for such a person. That is the first step. That is the entrance. You begin nowhere else. What did Jesus teach us? He taught us in Luke chapter 12, do not fear those who after killing your body can do nothing else to you. Rather, I say to you, fear him who after killing the body has the authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That's from the lips of Jesus. That's where it starts. And the fear of God comes upon this thief. And now he recognizes that both of them are going to be accountable to God for the sins they've committed in this life. And so he calls his friend out, And so he says, being accountable to God for our sins, that is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How can you mock him? How can you mock him? And he rebukes the other thief. God is waiting for us on the other side of this cross. God is waiting for us when we close our eyes in death. The fear of God has come upon him. See, the change starts with a right view of God. That's where the change in the sinner's heart happens, with a right perspective of God. But notice, he gets a right perspective of self next. Do you see it there? Look at his right view of self now. Verse 41. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. This softened thief knows his guilt And he now even confesses his guilt out of all the places to confess your guilt whilst hanging on a cross. He confesses his guilt and he rightly acknowledges, I deserve to be on the cross. Which sinner who has been saved can't join him and say, I deserve to be on that cross. I deserve that. Everything that happened there should have been for me. He acknowledges his guilt. See, there are no excuses coming from this cross on the right side of Jesus here. There's no excuses. He doesn't say to Jesus, I I was a robber. I stole for survival. There's no excuse. My father was a thief and that's all I've ever known. You get nothing of that. You get nothing of that. You get a remarkable confession of guilt and ownership. This is a remarkable confession. Why is it so remarkable? Because owning sin today is as rare as a lunar eclipse. It really is. I mean, it just is. Let's say it for how it is. Owning sin and taking responsibility, excuses for sin come as naturally to us as breathing. It's true. It's true. And guess what? 
It's nothing new. It's always been that way from the very beginning. When God comes questioning Adam for his sin, what does Adam say? This woman who you gave to me, she made me do it. And then God turns to Eve and he says, what is this thing you've done? The serpent, he deceived me. Fast forward to the Exodus after God's great salvation and mercy is on display. And Aaron builds the golden calf. And Moses comes down the mountain in fury. And he says, what is this you've done? All Aaron can muster up is, why did you take so long? Why, why did you take so We thought you weren't coming back. And the people gave me their gold. And so I put it in. And we made this calf. Why did you take so long? If you'd just come back. And do you think our generation has escaped the plague of excuses for sin. Do you think we have? We are drowning in it. We are drowning in it. And that is why psychology is the answer today. Because that's what it does. It gives excuses for sin. Why do you behave the way you do? Why do you do the sinful things you do? Because of past trauma. Because of upbringing. You cheat on your spouse. You act wicked because when you were younger, you were neglected. The excuses abound. It's not selfishness. I just read it this week. It's not selfishness. It's NPD. Narcissistic Personality Disorder. And I'm looking, what's this? And I'm reading about it for people who live destructive, selfish lives. They've got NPD. And so I went onto the Healthline website, clinical professionals on there, and they say, what are the causes for NPD, narcissistic personality disorder? These are the, these are the causes of it. This is from PhD professionals. Let me read them to you. Childhood neglect or abuse, excessive parental parent, uh, pampering, Unrealistic expectations from parents, cultural influences. What's the common theme from that list? I do the things I do because of all these things out there that happened to me. How opposite is psychology and Jesus? Psychology says you act the way you do because of all these other people and your circumstances. Jesus says out of the heart of man comes adulteries, thieving, lying, drunkenness. Out of the heart, the problem is inside. It's us. Yes, external things stir it up, but the problem's within. And that's why we see with Jesus we see that the problem isn't external things because Jesus was without sin and he faced every single temptation under the sun. But he was without sin. Why? Because he didn't have a corrupt heart. We have corrupt hearts. What's the problem, the world or us? We need to understand what we learn here is until we acknowledge our guilt, until we confess before God our spiritual bankruptcy, there is nothing we can do to please you, God. There is nothing. Only then, once you get to that point, are you ready for the Savior who's hanging in between the two thieves. Only then are you ready for him. And so I have to ask you, do you, each person here, do you see clear evidence of repentance in your life? Do you see evidence of this change of heart and change of mind, of owning sin before God? Do you see it clearly evidenced in your life? Alas, how rare is it? How many in churches don't possess it and they will swing into an eternity with a false assurance and their assurance will be their church attendance. And that assurance that they will swing into eternity will be their ministry. Oh yes, they were not an atheist. You'll see their photo in the church directory. And they expect a seat in the kingdom of God with this thief, and yet they are nothing like him. There is no ownership of sin, no acknowledgement, no confession 
no humility and remorse and brokenness before a holy and righteous God. Do you see it? Please, I ask you, do you see it? So we see here the great portrait of a transformed sin in this thief. He gets a right view of God. He gets a right view of self. And then he gets a right view of Christ. Do you see it there at the end of verse 41? We are punished justly for, what, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. Here it is. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. What a change. He was overwhelmingly guilty and now he sees Christ before him as the innocent one, as the guiltless one. And the Holy Spirit reveals to this thief on the cross that Jesus is other. He's other. He's innocent. He's a righteous man. Only God can do this. Only God can give such vision. He confesses Jesus is innocent. You think, well, that doesn't mean much. Pilate confessed Jesus is innocent. Pilate says that he wasn't guilty. But what's the difference between Pilate and this thief? Well, it leads us to the next point. We see the thief's rebuke and confession, but now we see a softened thief's saving faith. Look at his saving faith. Verse 42, Then he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You see, confession of your sin and a right understanding of who Jesus is, that's not enough for salvation. It's not. What is required for salvation? Saving faith. Saving faith. And that's what we see here. And I want you to see a few things that we notice about saving faith as opposed to just a general faith. You know that people talk about in the world, I believe in God, I believe in God. You know the kind of faith that is on par with demons? We believe in God. Well, firstly, notice that saving faith is a supernatural gift of God. Now, this story, this passage, I don't know if you've heard it much before, you've listened to many sermons on it, but this, this, this passage is often told or used to highlight that uh, the deathbed conversion, right? The, the conversion at the 11th hour is the easiest place to receive Christ. It, it's the most fitting place to receive Christ. And so really, when you see this thief put his faith in Jesus, it's really almost only natural. I mean, he's dying. What else would you do when you're faced with the brink of eternity before you, right? Deathbed conversion, and yet we completely miss the story. We completely miss it. His faith actually makes no human sense at all. It makes absolutely no sense. What do I mean by that? Well, who does he come to believe that Jesus is? Who does he believe Jesus is? What does he say? When you enter your kingdom... Remember me. He believes Jesus is the Messiah King when you enter your kingdom. He comes to believe Christ as King. Why is this so remarkable? Well, for many reasons. Jesus did not look much like a king when he was washing his disciples' feet. Jesus didn't look much like a king by the company that he kept. He hung around fishermen and tax collectors and ex-prostitutes. Jesus didn't look like much of a king with his kind of real estate that he owned. The Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head for rest. When he ministered, he did not look like a king. But I tell you, he never looked less like a king than when he was hanging upon a cross. He never looked less like a king than what he looked like before this thief. He was so weak. This thief watched Jesus unable to even carry his cross up Calvary. He watched Jesus wearing that unkingly crown of thorns. And he watched Jesus suspended, helpless as it were, nailed to those wooden beams. He didn't look much like a king, and he was a living monument of disgrace and humiliation. He was the 
almost king. But look at his fate. That's not kings. And worse yet, what did that thief hear when Jesus prayed? He heard Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what was the response that the thief heard from heaven? God turns out the lights on his only son at midday, and darkness covers the land. Judgment. Judgment from God. Condemnation from God. Rejection from God. That's what he sees. That's what he's looking at while he's on the cross. It doesn't look like a king. You see, such faith, such faith, faith is impossible from a human standpoint. It is utterly impossible. Why else was it utterly supernatural? Can you imagine you or any person putting their trust in another person whose situation is as bad as their own? This thief, he puts his eternal trust in a person who's being crucified next to him. It's like someone who's stranded on an island giving an SOS to another person who's stranded on an island. It doesn't make sense. He seeks help and rescue from someone who's dying. You seek help from the living. You don't seek help from the dying unless, unless you believe that death will not hold him. Unless you believe something's coming after for him. And he does. He does. You see, the Romans would write the criminal's crime above their head on the cross so you know what they were guilty of. Above Jesus was the blasphemous mockery statement, the king of the Jews. But to this thief, that statement seemed to be written in gold by the hand of God. he come to believe it. He come to believe it as written by God himself. What else do we see here about saving faith? Saving faith casts itself upon the mercy of Christ. Saving faith casts itself upon the mercy of Christ. What doesn't the thief do? What doesn't he do? He doesn't offer Jesus anything. Saving faith sings to Christ, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. He doesn't rattle off to Jesus any good works or he doesn't offer Jesus any service in the next world because saving faith sings, naked, come to thee for dress, helpless, look to thee for grace. It comes empty. It comes empty. It comes saying, God, I have nothing to offer you nothing i have nothing it simply pleads for mercy and that's what he's doing here this is a prayer a plea to jesus how simple is it and yet how wonderful is it jesus remember me jesus remember me that's all how different was that to james and john jesus disciples do you remember when they came up to jesus And they said, Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And Jesus replies to them, what is it you want? And they say, grant us to sit next to you on your right and on your left when you enter into your glorious kingdom. How different is this thief? When you get into your kingdom, just remember me. Just remember me. He's asking for crumbs. Just crumbs. Just remember me. He's asking. Nicholas Copernicus was a renowned scientist. And this famous scientist read this account of the thief before Jesus on the cross. And then he wrote down the following prayer after reading it. Let me quote his prayer. I do not ask for the grace you gave St. Paul nor can I dare ask for the grace that you granted St. Peter, but the mercy which you did show to the dying robber, that mercy showed to me. Jesus, remember me. 
also, can you just see that saving faith seizes the opportunity? It seizes the opportunity. How so? Will read for us before the parable of the banquet. How many are invited into Christ's kingdom? How many are invited to dine with Jesus Christ? And what is all that Christ gets? Excuses. Excuses. I can't. It's not the right time. It's not the right time for me to turn from sin. It's not the right time for me to believe in Jesus. There's too much going on. And what about this thief? He, he literally, he gets no sermon. Jesus doesn't even plead with him. Jesus doesn't even give him an invitation. And yet he calls upon the name of the Lord. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he does. So what does this mean for you? Understand this. Some of you have been taught about Jesus since your infancy. You've heard about Christ since you were a little boy or a little girl. Some of you teens who are here in the youth, you've heard Will pleading for, pleading for your soul week in, week out from his pulpit on a Friday night. Some of you have heard, overheard your parents praying for your salvation, crying out to God, when will my child turn from their sin? Some of you older folk, you've sat under Ian's preaching for years sat under his invitations to Christ for years and you still haven't responded. You still haven't pleaded for mercy. You still haven't confessed your bankruptcy. You still haven't offered that prayer, remember me, Jesus. You still haven't. And this thief who gets no invitation, he cries out to God and seizes the opportunity. Understand this, this thief in this passage tonight, he doesn't comfort you, he rebukes you. He rebukes you. I'm telling you, if you die in your sin tonight, you do not want to see him on judgment day. You do not want to see him. He rebukes you. So tonight, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Come to Christ. Bow down in submission. Confess your guilt. Own it. And believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your refuge and your Savior. Take him for the forgiveness of sins and for the hope of eternal life. No more excuses. No more excuses. It leads to our last point tonight. This saved thief's great reward. This saved thief's great reward. Verse 43 Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the wonder of grace. That wretched criminal, that rotten son of Adam, receives forgiveness and he's welcomed into the presence of God. See, he's not only forgiven of his sins, he's not only rescued from hell, but he's welcomed into the very presence of God. He's bid to come, and society deemed him unfit to even live amongst them, and so they execute him. But God makes him fit to dwell in his courts forever. That's the great reward. And I guess this answers that age-old question. You know that hypothetical question? If Hitler, in his final moments, came under conviction of sin, if he confessed his sin to Christ in repentance, and he put his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for his eternal destiny, would he go to heaven? This passage answers that question. It most certainly does. See, this thief, he used the life that God gave him for dishonor, and for shame, his crimes were worthy of the death penalty. He had no righteousness at all. And yet, he is wholeheartedly received by Jesus. Completely. So much for Roman Catholicism, right? No baptism to wash away original sin. No good works to complete your justification before God. No admittance into the holy church of Christ. No mediation from priests for your soul. This is the scandal of grace. Faith plus nothing equals salvation for eternity. Faith in Jesus Christ alone plus nothing equals the salvation of your soul. 
That is the gospel, Ephesians 2, 8, verse 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. How much in this one line from Jesus? How much is here? How precious is it? You will be with me in paradise. How much greater is the promise than the request? Think about it. How much greater is the promise than the request? The thief requests, Jesus, please, just remember me. And Jesus responds, remember you. You will be with me. You will be with me. Jesus, on that day, he won't say to his angels, yeah, 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 yeah I remember him. Let him in. Yeah, yeah, I remember him. No, Jesus is going to say in paradise, bring him in, bring him in that he may be with me and see my glory. He's mine. He's mine. How much greater is the promise? And Jesus promised this thief paradise. Paradise. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't use the generic term of heaven? He chooses to use the word paradise. How sweet would that have word sounded in the ears of this dying thief. For his sin, he was experiencing the complete opposite of paradise. He was nailed to a cross for his sins. And what's the reward and promise that he gets? You will be in paradise. You will be in paradise. This is what Jesus promises to every single Christian. When he writes to the church at Ephesus in Revelation, he says this to them, chapter 2, verse 7, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. You will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Heaven is described as Eden restored. That's how it's pictured. Eden restored. That thing that Adam, that place that Adam lost for the world, Jesus wins it back. Adam used to walk with God. And because of Jesus Christ, one day, Christian, you too will walk with God. You will walk with him in the cool of the day. You will enjoy, you will enjoy your Savior. And, and see, heaven is so much more than some kind of paradise utopia. Jesus says, you will be with me. That is the heaven of heavens. That is the heaven of heavens. You get to be with Jesus. You walk with him, you talk with him. In his presence is fullness of joy. You will enjoy him forever. You will walk and talk with him. You will commune with him. You will rest your head upon him. You will be embraced by him and you will ever live worshiping in his courts. And he will know you and call you by name every single day that you walk the courts and the fields of heaven and the new earth. That's heaven. That is paradise. And so Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Why does Jesus need to preface what he's about to promise with that statement? I tell you the truth or truly I say to you. Why? Because what he's saying is too good to be true, it seems, right? It just seems too good to be true. Jesus never lied. He only ever told the truth, and yet he starts off this promise. Truly, I say to you, I know it sounds too good to be true for sinners like you, but truly I say to you, see, no one's going to remember this thief in Israel. He's going to die. Israel's going to completely forget about him, yet the king of kings will remember him. It seems too good to be true. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And so this is the goodness of it. I mean, it's just amazing. That morning, he woke up in the guilt of his sin. That afternoon, he is the freest man on the planet. That morning, he woke up in a prison in Jerusalem. That evening, he wakes up in paradise. Doesn't it seem too good to be true? Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. So let me close. What lesson? These two, we, we, we spend our time looking at the two on the left and on the right of Christ. We see this incredible exchange. What do we glean from Christ in all of this? I mean, there's so much from the scriptures that we learn about Christ. What do we learn about him here? What we see, he will never, ever, 
ever turn away a repentant sinner. He will never reject anyone who comes to him humbly and with a broken heart. Understand this, what I see in this passage, there is never a bad time to come to Jesus. Never. For all purposes, this was the worst time to come to Jesus. Look at his physical suffering. Jesus, his, his body's torn apart. He's in utter physical agony as he hangs upon this. He nearly died before he got to the cross because of those floggings. He's in physical agony. On top of all of that, what about his spiritual agony? He's being punished by his father. He's separated by his father. He's bearing all of our sins. He's bearing that thief's sin upon himself. Do you think he physically felt like being gracious to this sinner? And yet, we see he did feel like it. There was never a worse time to seek Jesus' favor. And yet Jesus inclines his ear to this man, hears his confession, receives his faith as a sweet, fragrant offering, and promises him eternal life. How full of love is the heart of Christ for sinners. He will wear that badge and it will be his crown, the friend of sinners. How full of love is his heart. How wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Jesus Christ. In his dying breaths, he's receiving sinners. He's receiving sinners. And he's shielding them from the wrath of God with his blood, as we sang before. And so I ask you, if Christ was willing to hear the plea of a wicked sinner on that cross in his greatest hour of suffering, how much more is he willing to listen and receive any person in this room tonight who calls upon him for salvation? How much more ready is he now as he's seated at the right hand of the Father? How much ready is he? Luke reveals the kingdom in twos. In twos. And here we have two criminals, two responses to Christ, two destinations. One will spend an eternity in hell for their sin, and another, though guilty of the same sin, will spend eternity in the paradise of God because he believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. I ask you tonight, which side of Jesus are you on? Which side of Jesus are you on? It doesn't matter the condition that you came into this service tonight because both thieves mocked Jesus when they were nailed to that cross. It matters what happens right now. That's what matters. May you heed the call of Christ. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story that you have, this unique encounter that you preserve for us. Only Luke had recorded it, but we thank you for the Holy Spirit's inspiration. We thank you for this wonderful Easter message, but a message for all time. Father, we thank you for the, for the love, the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing compares to the love of Christ, and we've seen it so clearly on display tonight. I pray for each person here, for your saints who love you and believe in you and who can identify with that repentant thief. May you increase our joy, and may we look all the more forward to that day when we enter the very paradise of God. I pray that you would help each believer here to be faithful. And if they're going through trials, if they're going through struggles, keep them firmly fixed, their eyes looking forward unto the great reward that awaits all of your children. And Lord, I pray for any sinner who is living in rebellion to you. Oh God, may they humble themselves, acknowledge their sin, and believe in your only begotten Son, the Savior of the world. We pray these things because Christ is worthy of it and we are in great need. And so we ask it in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's